Hello, everybody. My name is Vivek Jha. I am the president of the International Society of Nephrology. I'm very pleased to welcome you and extend my greetings on the occasion of the World Kidney Day 2021. The World Kidney Day was launched by the International Society of Nephrology and the International Federation of Kidney Foundations in 2006 to broadcast a message about kidney health to the public, government health officials, general physicians, allied health professionals, individuals, and families. Since that year, it has gone from strength to strength and it celebrates different aspects of kidney health every year. In this year's theme, we recognize and celebrate people as being central to the World Kidney Day message. We want to stress that people with kidney disease can lead a healthy and successful life and maintain their role and social functioning in line with their own priorities, values, and their life goals. We rededicate ourselves as the kidney health community to the important task of providing a facilitating environment that improves their skills and allows them to get the most out of the healthcare system. We are extremely pleased that you all are able to join us in this webinar. The topics to be presented by a range of professionals and patient representatives will cover issues that are important to patients. I'm once again very pleased that you are with us and welcome you. I'll pass on now to my counterpart, Dr. S.F. Lewis, who is the president of the International Federation of Kidney Foundations. S.F. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you, wherever you may be around the world for these two online webinars across many time zones. I trust all of you are well, as we are still very much troubled by COVID. COVID will certainly limit the World Kidney Day activities around the world this year, but it has opened up a new option for us that we can meet together online. Now, over the past few years, the World Kidney Day film has focused on better kidney health for everyone everywhere. And this year, we have moved back to the film Better Care for Patients with Kidney Disease. We have taken it just to one high level, not just focused on treatment and replacement therapy, but on to live well with kidney disease. I just want to touch on a couple of points on the main theme for this year for you. Being diagnosed with kidney disease is a huge challenge, a big burden for patients and everyone around them. The patient has troublesome physical symptoms, psychological stress, affecting the daily life, the work and social life as well. As you may appreciate, the current status quo, so to speak, in kidney disease management is often very disease-centered aim at prolonging longevity by preserving, restoring, and substituting kidney functions and relief of symptoms. Uh, it is very much a system-centered care for efficiency as quite often required in a public healthcare system. But as uh, Rebecca said, this may not be adequate. Uh, this, it does not take into full consideration of the patient's priority and values. We believe people living with kidney disease want to be live well, not just alive maintain their role while maintaining some semblance of the normality and a sense of control of the health and being. So the World Clinic Day this year called for the inclusion of live participations as a key focus in the camp. We call for all patients and their families to be empowered to achieve their health outcomes and the life goals that they are meaningful and important to them. We call for a strengthened partnership in patients, which you hear Alison will say in a minute, we call for a strength-based approach to support our patients, to allow them to have confidence and control and in their cell management. We call for effective and integrated symptom management. You will hear Cam say something about that later on. Above all, we call upon all of us, all of us together, the healthcare professionals, to be a true partners with our patients, to engage them, to help themselves, to live well with kidney disease. I hope this webinar will address some of these issues. I hope you will find this webinar interesting and useful. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Alison Tong from the University of Sydney, and I'd like to thank the International Society of Nephrology and the International Federation of Kidney Foundations, the World Kidney Association, for the opportunity to talk about the framework of living well with kidney disease as part of the World Kidney Day campaign. And it's really exciting that the World Kidney Day campaign is focusing on living well with kidney disease because this really reflects patients' priorities. 
as shown in this quote here, I don't want to think about dying from my disease. I want to be able to live well with my disease. As part of the Standardized Outcomes in Nephrology Initiative or the SONG Initiative, we conducted a couple of surveys to try and establish what are the critically important outcomes for decision-making for patients, family members, and also health professionals. And we did this for a number of treatment stages, including hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and also transplantation. And each survey involved about a thousand participants. And in these graphs, we plotted the mean difference in the priority scores that the participants gave. So the scores on the left, these are the outcomes that were given higher priority by health professionals. And the points on the right, these were the outcomes given higher priority by patients and family members. And as an example here for hemodialysis, outcomes such as ability to travel dialysis free time were given higher priority by patients and family members. For peritone, uh, peritoneal dialysis, fatigue was given higher priority by patients and for transplant outcomes such as cognition and depression were more important for patients. And just to summarize across these surveys, health professionals consistently gave higher priority to outcomes such as mortality or death and hospitalization. Whereas quite a number of kind of lifestyle or quality of life related outcomes were given higher priority by patients and their family members, including ability to travel, dialysis free time, fatigue, cognition, depression, and ability to work. So this is the conceptual framework that was developed for the World Kidney Day. And the focus here is about enabling patients to live well with kidney disease. And this is about trying to improve life participation, the need for education, patient engagement and empowerment, and also to address symptoms and life impacts. And for my part of the talk, I will focus more on the life participation as well as using a strengths-based approach. So life participation is the ability to participate in meaningful activities of daily living, including work, study, social or recreational activities, all the things that are important to patients. And this has been established as a critically important outcome by patients and health professionals to be used in trials for decision-making. And currently there are measures being developed to assess life participation. The World Health Organization defines it as involvement in a life situation. So life participation, it can reflect the impact of symptoms that patients may experience, side effects, the burden of treatment, and also mental health. It relates to the ability to be able to maintain role in social functioning, and also about trying to achieve some semblance of normality in life and having control over health and well-being. Initially, this concept was perhaps more prominent or recognized in the fields of occupational therapy and disability, but it is gaining much broader recognition now in nephrology, but also um, in, ge in general health and, and medicine. So a patient said, what doctors don't ever ask is, are you doing anything outside of dialysis? Are you maintaining your activity? Have you still got your hobby? Any number of things like that would be a more important tell of where the patient was at compared with just numbers. A nephrologist similarly said, this tells you more about whether patients are getting enough dialysis than KT over V. And the importance of including patients' goals has been recognized and in recent guidelines published by the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis and KDGO, for example, explicitly mentioned that decisions around initiating dialysis, um, the choice of dialysis modalities, dialysis prescription should really be incorporating the patient's goals. And that can include life participation. And interestingly, her thought here about dialysis adequacy and how it was defined by patients. When you ask about adequacy, I think, what's my quality of life once I'm leaving the dialysis session? During my treatments that day, am I going to feel well enough to continue on with my day as far as the adequacy? Am I feeling well or am I going to feel tired? Another patient advocated for the need to take dialysis practice from being just adequate to rehabilitative. This is also another very telling statement from a patient who said, dialysis is a treatment which keeps us alive 
to live a life and not just to wait for death. This is a figure taken from a recent article published in Nature Reviews Nephrology around the need to change the ecosystem of dialysis care and technology to support transformative outcomes. And just to highlight here about recognizing and integrating patient priorities. And this could include physical symptoms, fatigue, cramps, pain, or symptoms related to mood and mental health, depression, anxiety, frustration, and also rehabilitation priorities. And listed here include things like ability to work, ability to travel, impact on family and friends, and mobility. There's also been growing recognition of the need to kind of move more towards a strengths-based approach in practice, rather than kind of applying a deficit lens. So with a strengths-based approach, it recognizes that each individual has strengths and capabilities to overcome the problems and challenges faced. And it does require collaboration and cultivation of the patient's hopes, aspirations, interests, and also values. So it's about focusing on what is working rather than what needs fixing finding solutions with the patient, not just for the patient. Trying to work out sustainable solutions, not just that which is short term, learning from past successes, prioritizing the person rather than the illness, building coping skills rather than just trying to avoid problems, the patient being responsible for their health, a collaborative partnership instead of kind of a doctor knows best approach and having success defined by the patient. And just some suggestions or actions, particularly that which relates to enabling patients to live well and participate in life, to establish a patient reported outcome measure and work is going on in this area, to conduct routine assessment of life participation in clinical care, to address this explicitly in communication and shared decision making, we also ask for regulators to support this as a metric for quality of care or to support labeling claims for medicines and devices and for funders to establish targeted calls for studies that are focused on enabling patients to live well and perhaps with life participation as an outcome. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Cam Kalantar Zadeh, a nephrologist from Southern California in the United States. Uh, I'm privileged to present today on optimizing symptom management uh, within the theme of living well with kidney disease. I also represent uh, the International Federation of Kidney Foundations World Kidney Alliance, which has enhanced its vision, mission, and strategy to partner with kidney patient groups and advocacy organizations. The World Kidney Day has been around for the past 15 years. Each year, there is a special theme. In the past several years, there have been themes such as kidney disease in children, women, access to care, prevention. And this year, 2021, the theme of the World Kidney Day is living well with kidney disease. We know that every year, half a million to a million people transition to what we call kidney replacement therapy in the form of dialysis or kidney transplantation. This is done because dialysis and kidney transplantation offers hope as compared to a disease which would not be consistent with life. This is a conceptual model in that we believe that as kidney disease progresses, there is a need for kidney replacement therapy. However, there are options to start this dialysis or transplantation early or later or also never. Now, whereas the uh, option of not starting dialysis or not offering kidney transplantation is also referred to supportive care or conservative kidney management, the conventional approach in many places is to start dialysis even earlier if possible. These efforts are all done based on one keyword, hope. Hope, why is it important? Because it's the feeling of expectation and desire for a certain outcome to happen. That means high can live long and prosper and happy. Hope is a feeling of trust. For instance, in 1973, when in the United States, access to dialysis and kidney transplantation became universal, 
It was not just to survive, but also to maintain hope, hope of continuing valued relationships, hope of rehabilitation, and hope of achieving life goals and pursuits. Now, within the hope strategy, there should be choices. Choice. What is choice? Choices where there are more than one or two options available. And not infrequently, we believe that that uh, approach to, patient, to patients with kidney disease, either full dialysis therapy or palliative care without dialysis. This dichotomy should probably be replaced with different options, such as conservative and preservative management, expanded use of palliative care with symptom management, gradual transition to dialysis and palliative dialysis. So if you look at these four different options, in addition to the two traditional dichotomized options, I would like to emphasize on expanded use of symptom management. Now, why is it important? Because within the kidney care chart model, it's uh, preservative management, palliative care, dialysis and kidney transplantation, there should be an important area for symptom management. In fact, symptom management should should be offered in the entire area of uh, kidney care management. Now, with, kidney, with symptom management, this is different from the traditional symptomatology that physicians learn in medical school. Effective symptom management is about addressing unpleasant symptoms beyond traditional CKD treatment and beyond management of urea, timely detection, focused therapy, and patient-centered approach to symptom management. And it's wrong to assume that offering the other kidney transplantation will take care of the problems. That's wrong, and, and patients continue to suffer, not infrequently, despite the others, despite transplantation. And, and we need to here learn more effectively from other disciplines, such as oncologists, who, who help patients to, to do extremely well. Therefore, symptom management is not offering dialysis or transplantations. It's about identifying patterns of symptom burden and tools for assessment, intervention, and individualizing management of these symptoms in an effort to improve quality of life. Patients live well with kidney disease. There is enough problems with kidney disease management, including restrictions, dietary restrictions, fluid restrictions, pill burden, strict dialysis regimens, immunosuppressive uh, uh, medications, and alleviating unpleasant symptoms can lead to improved patient outcomes. This is a model of uh, kidney disease with uremia, aging medications, prescribed medications, and coexisting comorbidities all together, leading or enhancing unpleasant symptoms such as decreased appetite, fatigue, lethargy, depression, anxiety, nausea, vomiting. And as kidney function gets worse, there is cognitive, cognitive dysfunctions, pruritus, itchiness, restless legs, sleep disorders, muscle cramps. So the World Kidney Day 2021 decided that this year should be devoted to living well with kidney disease. This is the chart of living well with kidney disease, life participation, education management, empowerment, and also addressing symptoms, symptoms that were listed here. I would like to highlight two studies here. One was by uh, several groups of uh, colleagues who found patients with kidney disease suffer not infrequently, actually 89%, up to 59% uh, suffering uh, from fatigue, sleep disorders, pain, and pruritus. And another study also, again, feeling tired or lack of energy, dry skin or itchiness, trouble falling asleep, trouble staying asleep, muscle cramps. So therefore, I would like to highlight this important message, dialyze to live, don't live to dialysis, uh, to dialyze. And this is very important. That means dialysis and kidney transplantation are offered as additional options to live well with kidney disease. And uh, this is a patient who started dialysis at the age of 71 and did extremely well for eight more years until the age of 79. And, and, uh, and this is not the only person who has emphasized living well with kidney disease. So in conclusion, effective symptom management in chronic kidney disease is an important part of living well with kidney disease. 
COVID-19 pandemic has <clears throat> overshadowed many activities. But still, the World Kidney Day 2021 is about living well with kidney disease, this, despite all these problems and, and previous problems. Living well with kidney disease includes patient and care partner empowerment, life participation, and effective symptom management. Patients with CKD and their care partners should feel well and supported through concerted efforts by kidney care communities and all stakeholders all throughout the world. Living well with kidney disease is an important goal of all kidney foundations, patient groups, and professional societies. Thank you very much. Good day. First, I would like to thank the World Kidney Day Steering Committee for inviting me to participate in this very important webinar on the actual World Kidney Day, the 11th March 2021. So this year, we are having the Living Well with Kidney Disease as our main theme. And my task today is actually to share with you how to optimize renal replacement therapy. We all know that dialysis can be divided into peritoneal dialysis PD, and PD can be divided into continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, CAPD, as well as motivated peritoneal dialysis, APD. And both these are home dialysis therapy. While hemodialysis can be done either as in-center or also in home as home hemodialysis. As we reported in our Living with World Kidney Day Disease editorial, there are strategies that we can help to optimize renal replacement therapy, including the preservation of residual kidney function, incremental transition to dialysis, and also patient-centered dialysis prescriptions. And we think that the home dialysis, including APD, CAPD, and home hemodialysis, are probably best suited for patient-centered dialysis prescriptions. I would like to use Hong Kong as an example. Starting in 1985 in Hong Kong, renal failure patients will be put on CAPD as first-line modality of treatment unless there's a medical contraindications. So we report in 2013 about our PD first policy made successful. As a matter of fact, this year we are celebrating the 35th anniversary of the Hong Kong PD first policy and of this symposium highlighting the good outcome and also quality of life with PD compared with other dialysis modalities. And I will invite you to join this symposium if you can. At the same time, we are also promoting home hemodialysis and comparing home hemodialysis with in-center hemodialysis. Home hemodialysis patients have reduction in number of antihypertensives significant decrease in depressive score or post-dialysis recovery time, significantly better quality of life, better survival, and also reduced cardiovascular hospitalization. So this is the data from USRDS in 2018, comparing home hemo peritoneal dialysis and in-center hemodialysis. I can say that Hong Kong is quite proud that we take the lead of over 71% of patients on PD, about 3% of patients on home hemodialysis, about 26% of patients on in-center hemodialysis. And around the world, you can see many countries and regions also show significant increase and also usage of home dialysis as shown here. If you look in some of the data, suggesting what the, the patient preferences for dialysis modalities. Home-based therapies were actually significantly preferred with the following attributes, like longer survival, increased treatment flexibility, and improved well-being. This is a meta-analysis showing the physical health-related quality of life in patients who are using home hemodialysis or home dialysis. And you can see that they have a better physical health-related quality of life for home dialysis patients with multiple studies across different continents and different countries. Quite a few years back, we have been already promoting the increase of the home-based dialysis therapy in order to tackle dialysis burden around the world. And as you would fully understand that dialysis actually can be quite economic burden 
for the patients, for the government, as well as for the society. In 2019, the executive order in the America with the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative with three goals, and one of which is actually ensuring 80% of new kidney failure patients in 2025 are either receiving dialysis at home or are receiving a transplant. So we can see a surge of interest having a successful peritoneal dialysis first program as reviewed in this editorial from myself and also Professor Mark Rosenberg from the American Society of Nephrology. And not only about the clinical outcomes, as a matter of fact, in times like the COVID-19 epidemics, the use of home-based therapies have its own significant benefit. This is a report from the London Centre for the dialysis. And out of 1,500 patients of their dialysis, they have about 20% of them contracting COVID-19. If you look at out of the 300 patients who contracted COVID-19, about 97% of them are either having hemodialysis as satellite unit or in hospital. While home dialysis patients, either hemodialysis or PD, only have around 3.3% of them actually contracted COVID-19. And also compare one of the studies in China with the PD center there, none of the PD patients or staff reported COVID-19. Next, I would like to say something about the live participation of the dialysis patients. It's very important that they can do meaningful activities of life, including but not limited to work, study, family responsibilities, travel, sport, social and recreational activities. I would like to share with you the Hong Kong Society of Nephrology, whom that they have arranged and organized quite a few renal patient activities in order to enhance the live participation, including table tennis, gay ball, cooking, karaoke, as well as poste. We also include bird watching or some of the hobbies for the patients. We also think that cultural and social rehabilitation is important. So this is are some of the musicals specifically commissioned for renal patients in Hong Kong. And this is the big theater with the patients there watching a commissioned musical called The Good Man from Sichuan. So finally, I would like to highlight a phrase as reported from one of a patient receiving dialysis. Dialysis is a treatment which keeps us alive to live a life, not just to wait for death. So it's our clinicians to optimize renal replacement therapy. We have a lot of the clinical strategies, but at the same time, we also need to take care of what the patient wants, especially in terms of how to live a life. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, wheresoever you may be around the world. I'm most honored to have the opportunity to speak on patient engagement, what matters to patients. This is an important topic for the patients to live well with kidney disease. In the position paper for World Kidney Day 2021, towards patient-centered care for people living with kidney disease, we have highlighted the need for a continuum of engagement at direct care level, organization level, and policy making level. For organization level, there's a need to survey patients about their care experience. And I'll put it to you, there's also a need to find out how our patients are doing and what matters to them. For patients with kidney disease, it's a lifelong journey. From awareness of a kidney disease to protect their own kidneys, to identify who may be at risk, making a diagnosis. Then there's a need to accept the disease understand the disease and learn how to manage the disease. The management is not easy. There's a need to treat the underlying disease to slow down the deterioration, manage the symptoms, and also secondary prevention. For some unfortunate patient who may move on to end-stage kidney failure, there's a need uh, to work out the renal replacement therapy, the options, and how to optimize them. I also put it to you, there's a need to plan for the future not only on medical care, but also on family, work, lifestyle, life impact, and financial matters as well. It is very much a case of engagement of the patient right from beginning till the end. 
At some stage, they have to be actively participating in the care. And you, you will be even better if they can be empowered to look after themselves. Alison has already outlined the conceptual framework on living well with kidney disease, clinical strategies, symptoms, life impacts, and a strength-based approach. We call upon you to turn this framework into action. Engage your patients for patient-centered care with a focus on the symptoms and the life impacts. I would like to share with you what we have done in Hong Kong for the World Kidney Day. Hong Kong Kidney Foundation and Hong Kong Society of Nephrology have jointly developed a questionnaire for patients for self-assessment and reflection on whether they are living well with kidney disease or not. We have conducted a survey with this questionnaire to see how our group of patients are managing with living well, what may be troubling them, what matters to them, what they would like others, such as healthcare professionals, healthcare system, family and friends to help them. And equally important is how they can help themselves. It is a very simple questionnaire saying that I'm a patient on hemodialysis or peritonitis. My assessment of I'm living well with kidney disease with a score of one to 10. And then they select uh, this list of symptoms, physical, psychological, and life impact that may be affecting them or concerning them. The lists are shown here. They are uh, outlined in the framework already. The physical symptoms, we have separate out the psychological symptoms and add in one or two extra. Stress, anxiety, depression, and concern about our futures. And there's also a list of life impact things. We envisaged that they may select more than one item, or in fact, quite a few items from each category. So we asked them to focus on the top three items, problems, and concern that matters to them most that we can focus on with them. We also guide them through a list uh, of action which they could do for themselves to make life better and live well with kidney disease, such as comply with medical advice, medications, comply with dialysis, uh, to be empowered, keep fit, eat well, watch your body weight, etc. We also allow them to write down what they would like others to do to help them, to support them, so that they could live well with kidney disease. They can use an online Google form to complete the survey or a hard copy, and it will take only about five minutes for them to complete the survey. It's quite straightforward. So in Hong Kong in January this year, we have conducted a survey for all our patients online because of the COVID, we couldn't meet them together. Um, we received 1,138 returns, and the findings were actually reported in the World Kidney Day webinar that was held on Sunday with our patients and also with our healthcare professionals. As the president of the International Federation of Kidney Foundation, I have offered uh, this concept and this questionnaire to our members. And I'm pleased to know that they find the concept and approach uh, interesting and they have adopted the questionnaire and translate into their own language and they conduct a survey. In January and February, um, eight members of uh, the country have actually conducted the survey and I received a return from seven of them, uh, including 4,800 returns. It's a challenge for me now to share with you the preliminary findings from this pilot study as there's so many data. What I'd like you to do is to share with you the top five items, symptoms, concerns, and options that for each of the questions that the patient group has reported from these seven organizations. I'll show you some idea on the preference of the top five and show you the variation. In fact, there's very little variation between the countries. The patient have score between 5.8 to 6.8 in terms of overall score of 10. There's a little bit of variation, but not much. On the questions is to identify those physical problems that's concerning you. The number of centers reporting fatigue and sleep problems as one of the top five items. All of them have actually done that. All seven centers have reported fatigue and sleep problems. Five reported pruritus, four on cramped, three on thirsty and fruit restriction as a problem, and mobility as well. So all of them find fatigue and sleep problem uh, as a major problem, which is probably more than we appreciate. 
this is a busy slide, but I just want you to focus on the fact that fatigue actually is the top percentage return by the patients. 71% of the patient for Hung Hungarian uh, actually find fatigue as a major problem. Other find 56%, 61%. You can also see here sleep problem is also quite prominent problem, uh, up to 48% of patients in the Renal Foundation as well. On the psychological problem, they all find concern about future as a common concern that they're all faced with. They all find a variable degree of anxiety, stress, and depression. That's shown here. Concern about futures, 66%, 58%, 67%. Um, the high percentage of anxiety or even under stress, and even some report has been depressed by the patient as well. On the life impact, six of the seven centers return that their patients are very concerned about financial impact and the ability to work, ability to travel, change in lifestyle, and also the diet restriction as well. This slide also show you that here, the financial impact was top ranked top number one concern by many organizations, patients from many organizations. So it's ability to work, dark green color here, ability to travel and diet restriction as well. As, and as we envisaged, envisaged that they all of them have take many concerns. So we asked them to prioritize the top three and this is what they return. Of the seven organization who returned their uh, result to us, all seven of them report their patient fund fatigue as a major problem, concern about futures, financial impacts and sleep problem as well. And this is quite interesting finding. On what I can do for myself to live well with kidney disease, uh, this is somewhat a guiding question for them to learn how to uh, help themselves. Uh, it's, it seems that they are all very good patients in, in terms that they will comply with medical advice, including medication, take better care of themselves, they will eat well, they eat smart, and they comply with dialysis. But I would like to point out to you, they have not actually chosen some items such as willingness to be empowered for self-care. Self-reflection and sharing with the problem of other people, and they, none of them actually make a high priority of making plan for the future, which I think is very important. So I would like to sum up by saying that for this pilot study, we find that what concern patient most is the fatigue, concern about the futures, concern about the financial impact, and they have problem with the sleep problem as well. Um, we need to focus on this problem for them. So there's a call for action to engage patient to be aware of what is troubling them, concerning them, understand what matters to them most. It's a process of engagement, partnerships, and empowerment. So there's a call for to identify and manage the symptoms even better than what we are doing now. Researching the symptoms, such as fatigue, and see what we can do for our patients. We need to optimize the treatment. We need to address the psychological elements and also reduce the impact on their lives. The survey is on the group of patients. At the end of the day, what's important is for each individual patients. I take the view that we need a self evaluation tools, such as apps on hard copy, that allow the patient to self evaluate themselves so that they can present uh, their, their problem to the healthcare doctors, um, the people who work with them, so that they can understand the problem they're faced with. At the end of the day, it's most important that we help them to look after themselves, to engage them, and to be empowered, and we will work with them together. I thank you for your attention. Hello, and happy World Kidney Day, wherever you are in the world. I'm Tess Harris. I'm Chief Executive of the Polycystic Kidney Disease Charity in the UK, and a kidney patient. And I'd like to thank the World Kidney Day Organising Committee for inviting me to give my perspectives on living well with kidney disease. I thought I'd start with my family history. This photo is me with my parents, three sisters and two brothers, a large Catholic family. It was our younger brother's first communion, so I must have been about 13 or 14. About this time, I think my father had become aware of having ADPKD, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, the world's most commonly inherited kidney disease which counts for one in 10 people on dialysis or who've had a transplant. He'd been orphaned at three and had no idea he'd inherited it from his mother. Unfortunately, he passed on to four of us, the ones shown here with the red ring, 
my older sister, me, my younger sister and brother. My older brother and younger sister, ringed in white, didn't inherit. I was about 20 when I was scanned and formally diagnosed. There was no internet then. So I went to a medical bookshop and read that ADPKD was incurable and average age of death was 57. I didn't feel unwell, so I'd just decided to get on with life. Later, I learned that our family had the fastest progressing PKD mutation and I realised that I would inevitably end up with kidney failure. And you can see from this genetic diagram that my father did in fact die at 57. We lost our older sister at 59 in 2012. She'd had a kidney from our older brother, but when that failed, she had complications. As is often the case in ADPKD, progression amongst us siblings varied. My younger sister was transplanted in 2013. My younger brother has just started dialysis this year. I progressed slower than all of them. I started dialysis in 2019 and was fortunate to get a kidney transplant last October. So I know what it's like to have kidney disease. As many of you will know, ADPKD is characterised by the relentless growth of cysts that cause both kidneys to expand massively, as you can see in the photo below. But in fact, just two of these ladies have ADPKD. The one in the middle is pregnant. But unlike the pregnant lady who will lose her big bump after nine months, the other two ladies will have them for life. People with ADPKD, as with other kidney diseases, suffer from a raft of symptoms. Two in three of us will have chronic pain that's almost impossible to treat. As a result of these massive kidneys, abdominal discomfort and bloating is common. Most people will have high blood pressure and ADPKD can damage the heart. The cysts will burst, bleed and cause infections. Some people have frequent kidney stones and urinary tract infections. There's progressive loss of kidney function and kidney failure for most is inevitable. Inevitable too is the ongoing impact on life participation. The need to make dietary and lifestyle changes from failing kidneys and being on dialysis having to take multiple medications throughout life, managing a variety of symptoms and the ever-present fatigue that sleep doesn't fix. There's anxiety about the future and even depression is common, not to mention the healthcare commitments. I've spent a good portion of my life sitting in hospital waiting rooms, traveling to and from clinics, whilst trying to keep a job and home going. As many of you with kidney disease will know, managing your kidney disease takes a lifetime. But I've learned to live well with my kidney disease. And mainly this is through practicing stoicism. For those who don't know, stoicism is a philosophy that helps people live the best life they can. And I try to follow the stoic principles every day. So I focus on, on what's up to me what I can control, not what I can't control. I can't control my genetic kidney disease, but I can control what I think and feel about it. I don't regard it as a curse, it is what it is. And this means I'm able to accept what happens with calm and not worry too much about the future. I firmly believe that knowledge is empowering. So I've educated myself about ADPKD and kidney disease. That's helped give me confidence and enable me to make the right decisions about my healthcare and options. I look after my body as best I can. I eat healthily and try not to moan about food restrictions. I exercise to keep my heart and bones strong. I don't want to waste the time I have left. I want to be useful, so I keep my mind active and I participate as much as possible in the UK and the international kidney community. Every day at the PKD charity, 
I try to support others with PKD who come to us for support, often when newly diagnosed and in a state of shock. But most of all, I enjoy the festival of life every day because I might not be here to tomorrow. I do allow myself to think a little bit about the future, COVID permitting, some travel, spending time with my siblings and extended family, pottering in my garden, going back to the kidney conferences, meeting old friends and making new ones. Thank you very much for listening. And here's where you can find me on Twitter. So thank you very much for all the speakers who share with us uh, your experience and your views on how to live well with kidney disease for yourself or for patients. So I'm here with uh, Professor Vivek Jha together to moderate this session. And then uh, we have received quite a few uh, questions already. So I am going to alternate with uh, Vivek on uh, the different questions. Why do you create World Kidney Day Initiative for ISN and IFKF? Maybe first uh, from Vivek and then uh, from SF. Thanks, Philip. Uh, as you know, having been uh, in the ISN leadership for uh, a long, long time, uh, that just as we were uh, rounding the corner to this century, uh, we, we did realize that uh, the visibility for kidney disease, despite it being very common, was extremely low. And there were a number of reasons for that. The global nephrology community had not been very good in even accurately defining kidney disease, especially chronic kidney disease. Around the early part of the century, uh, the kidney disease improving global outcomes or KDGO came up with uh, the definition and classification scheme for CKD, which allowed us to uh, kind of develop a homogeneous uh, definition and classification system. We started speaking the same language. And then the leadership really thought that it was important for us to come together to spread this message uh, to the global community. Uh, advocacy was critical. And that was uh, the reason that the two organizations, the ISN and the IFKF came together to spread the message to the rest of the world that kidney disease is common. And since at that time, evidence was also emerging that even early stage of kidney disease could really be harmful. So kidney disease is common and kidney disease is harmful. But then on the back of new advances that had been made specifically uh, showing that good blood pressure control, good blood sugar control, use of acinimeters, uh, lifestyle interventions, etc., is able to retard the progression of kidney disease. We also wanted to spread a message of hope that kidney disease is also treatable. So that was a very simple message at that time. And we thought that message needed to be taken to the global community, which included uh, policymakers, which included healthcare professionals, which are not nephrologists necessarily, but also to patients and their families, because it was extremely important that we continue to same, speak the same language, that they should receive a message of hope, that receiving a diagnosis of kidney disease is not, uh, not a message of doom and gloom, uh, but that there is a lot that we can do together and we need to talk uh, in the same language about it. So that, that, that was the reason this uh, initiative was started, Philip. Thank you. So SF, maybe uh, briefly from uh, IFPF uh, sort of uh, point of view. Yes, I, 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 I concur with what Vivek has said. In fact, there's a little bit of history. Philip will remember in 2001, 20 years ago, we had the first Hong Kong Kidney Days already. We see the need to have a forum, a platform that we can work with people and get to the community. And I think towards the year 2005 or thereabouts, and Joe Coppo, most of you actually know him. And then on the IFKF side, ourselves from Hong Kong and Italy actually voice out that we, that's a world day for everything. Why, why not a kidney? You no, know, it cannot be like that. It cannot be like that. So I to, it's very good. Uh, the success, uh, the people there at ISN and IFKF uh, joined to see the need. And that was 2006. You know, this, this is fantastic. It's really a collective movement. People get together. It's a united force. It's the same language. I show you the data. Every single patient around the world is the same. We all face the same problem. If we can work together, uh, we'll be a much stronger force. My plea with you, and I know ISN and our people are working behind the scene. We need to elevate it 
World Tennis Day, not just an event of ISN and ISKF, but a proper World Tennis Day under WHO. There's a WHO Hepatitis Day, the WHO TV Day. We must get ourselves onto that platform. So Vivek, we're looking forward to your leadership to get us going. World Tennis Day, truly WHO World Tennis Day in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. Maybe Vivek, you can choose some questions. Thanks, Philip, and thanks, Asaf. Uh, indeed, that is the next frontier we must breach. Uh, we must get uh, uh, to these multilateral agencies and, and get those sorts of uh, important uh, recognition. That's that's critical. Thank you. So uh, the next question that we have is, uh, what are the key measures of patient well-being when it comes to kidney care? Uh, as we realize this uh, year's theme is focused on patient care. So how do we, re we have spoken about a few things related to the song initiative and the other parameters that have come out of it. Uh, but Tess, if you could also provide your perspective as to what from your own personal experience, as well as from your experience of, uh, you know, have, having done this huge uh, number of years of work of advocacy with patients, you have gathered a vast treasure trove of experience and it will be great for us to hear from you uh, what what do patients think uh, that you know uh, that means well-being for them and also if uh, if possible you could also comment on possible variations across regions and even within the same region across socioeconomic group, groupings we are seeing the last one uh, specifically from the point of view of covid pandemic that certain socioeconomic groups are particularly badly affected so it'd be really great to hear from you. Mm, yes, two uh, very interesting questions. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it, living well and how to measure it. I was really fascinated to hear about the study that uh, SF has conducted with colleagues and uh, how much it echoed what the song found, you know, that it's the life participation factors that really matter, the fatigue, the the difficulty with sleep, the, the anxiety, concern about the future and so on. And certainly with a, you know, from my point of view, the inherited disease, that's that's uppermost in people's minds when they get that diagnosis, uh, you know, what is going to happen. Um, and and yet it's it's, uh, it's never covered in, in clinic appointments. Uh, you know, the default questionnaire around the world seems to be the EQ5D, which doesn't really seem to capture uh, these measures and and I certainly think we should be pushing for uh, you know a kind of universal measure of living well um, using the song outcome uh, core outcome set and you know and just galvanize people to think more about the person and and their and, and the life they live rather than the clinical metrics that we're so familiar with uh, you know, I think over the over the years, as a, just from personal experience, I've hardly had anyone ask me how I how I am, how I how I'm feeling. Uh, you know, taking a, an interest in me as a, a as a person, asking about my home life or my work life and so on. It's always the numbers, uh, the blood, the blood pressure, and then see you next year sort of thing. Until um, and, and that increasingly gets more intense, of course, with failure. Um, so, you know, I think I think it is time that we we did really uh, prioritise these um, these important measures of of people's health and well-being, not just the not just the clinical metrics. Um, and and reflecting on some of the the voices of patients uh, who engage with me and my organisation, and uh, and certainly experience with the international groups it's the same you know I don't people don't feel they're being listened to and that uh, they're they're again the same the same issue no one's listening to how they are how they are in themselves uh, asking about how they are coping and living with their CKD um, your second question was around uh, was really about inequality which is, is a major topic at the moment, uh, certainly in Europe and the UK, and um, particularly it's been highlighted by COVID. Um, and in the in Europe, the uh, European Kidney Health Alliance has just issued a call to action 
very much focusing on improving the care of patients post-COVID, uh, highlighting the, the inequalities. We know that COVID has affected kidney disease patients uh, significantly more than many other conditions, including heart and lung. And yet, uh, you know, hardly ever hear about kidneys in the press. Uh, it's, you know, it's always, it's okay, it's diabetes and being, being older or being of a certain ethnic background. But, you know, the mortality figures are shocking. You know, one in four or one in five of patients on dialysis to transplant uh, dying from COVID, you know, let alone the, 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 the longer term impacts of, of COVID uh, on people who, uh, the kidney long term impacts on, COVID, on people who've had COVID. So, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of work to be done there, but you know, it has, and I don't know how you tackle it, of course, it's, uh, you have to tackle it at a country level and then at a regional level. Um, yes, big, big challenges ahead, but I think, you know, we need to be elevate prioritising again and making a noise uh, internationally about inequality. Okay. Uh, SF, uh, uh, what's the best tranquil for these patients to improve their life? Right. Let me start by saying that I um, haven't listened to Edison and, and, and Cam. In fact, what we've done with seven countries, look at the same problem in a different way, focus it. Because uh, some of you know that I work very closely with quality and safety and patient relations with BMJ and IHI. And we have this conversation at this moment, what matters? You know, there's so many things. We, we, we cannot do everything for everyone. So let's try to focus one or two things that are important. So I think our study actually highlight the need for fatigue. Um, I, I, we all know that fatigue is a major problem, but I think, I, I, honestly, after 30 years as a kidney specialist, I didn't realize that, that was that bad. Uh, so I think we can do more work on that. So to our patients, it seems very strongly they're fatigued and not sleeping. Not sleeping is a major problem. I'm sure we can do something about that. But in the cohort things that we have, okay, I admit that we don't have everyone around the world, but we don't we have Italy and Hungary. Um, the financial impact is worried them. You know, this worried them. You know, that's what happens if I go and, and I'm not here who we'll look after the family. I think those are things that matter to them. There's no one single answer, but I would just like by saying that I, I wish everyone, it has been a very painful exercise for everyone with COVID. You know, we didn't see it coming, we didn't see the way it's going, but this is opportunity. This is opportunity. We can't do things when things are okay. This is opportunity for us to do something quite different with everyone. The new approach, the way we see patients, the way we support patients, the way we do home hemodialysis. In Hong Kong, we hardly have anyone die from, or in fact, we have only one death on, on renewable replacement, hardly anyone. Um, the future is all about how we can remotely monitor things. We must make better use of AI. You know? um, I've been talking to our group. Uh, I don't know about you, UK or, or US. The patient in Hong Kong have about five minutes, eight minutes to see a doctor. <laughs> it's about time you say hello and uh, see you next time, as you say. And we must have mean that they can do self-assessment. You know, just like everything you do now. You, you do a self-assessment, present a doctor. Oh, this is what's troubling me. I'm sure that's, that's the thing you have. But I'll go back to the three main things that a very strong message for everyone. Fatigue, not able to sleep. Uh, um, get very concerned about future. That's difficult. Um, but also uh, the impact of life. But what concerns me is when I guide them through what they can do for themselves, none of them actually talk about the need to plan for future. The number of patients I've just seen, as you know, uh, Tess, we wish everyone long life, etc. But we live one day, we hope for the best. We don't know what happened. But you must also plan for the not so good days as well. And most patients are not well planned. And this is a quality safety movement around the world, is that you have to plan. Thank you, uh, SF. Uh, very, very important. Uh, we have a number of other questions as well uh, coming from a number of groups. Let me just pick up and identify the ones that uh, I think we did discuss this, uh, and and there are some very specific questions which we might uh, pass on and maybe you know come back to uh, the audience. Uh, and I don't know whether uh, Cam is not online because he he is the one who had most of the presentations about about uh, the symptom relief, uh, but. Maybe you can 
find them off and I see where I can fill them for camp because I talk to okay. camp very often. We have talked about quite a lot of issues. A camp is actually, as you understand, this is four o'clock in the morning for him. So he's not joining us, but he's joining us in the other one that's 12 hours from now in the morning. Correct. If you want, I can try there it. There are a number of other comments that we have, we have received from uh, the people who are attending the session. Uh, they, they appreciate the comments that have been made, especially uh, how these challenges are magnified in low socioeconomic countries and the need for multidisciplinary approach, which is not always available, especially in low resource countries. And uh, you know, people say that there should be more World Kidney Day recognition events uh, around the world. So that's that's really very uh, important. And people are grateful for the information uh, that has been provided. So uh, there, there is a question about home dialysis. And Philip, uh, I'm wondering if you have any experience. Hong Kong is really uh, the leader in providing home dialysis to patients through the PD First initiative, etc. Uh, although it's a bit far from uh, the main message of the World Kidney Day, but still dialysis is important and, and people on dialysis do feel miserable and it, it's great uh, and that they're asking these questions. So does home dialysis make them feel better you know do are they able to live better if they are on home dialysis and if you have any other insights to offer philip thank you uh i i dare to say i've been the promoter for home dialysis probably over 15 to 20 years and well started with the pd in hong kong you know that pd is peritoneal dialysis is home dialysis and then uh, for the past 10 years or more we are promoting home hemodialysis as well i think that uh, uh the quality of life of patients who can do dialysis at home is obviously much better. Just take, for example, if you take an in-center patient who need to go for in-center for hemodialysis, the traveling time that he needs or she needs to go to the center and coming back, and then uh, the time that is booked uh, to have the scheduling with the places, just thinking about all this, uh, uh, day, all this uh, uh, amount of time spent, is already affecting so much of their uh, daily activities. While if you're doing home dialysis, a lot of the flexibility and autonomy resides into the patient's own schedule. If you can do it at the nighttime, put for example, home hemodialysis, you can do it at nighttime or you can do it at the daytime when you are on holiday. And for automated PD, similar arrangement can be made. For CAPD, three exchanges a day, you can sort of a, uh, the other times you can do other things. So just simply on the home schedule, I mean on the uh, time schedule of their daily activities. And then brings to back to the point of live participation. I mean the live participation of patients will be much easier if the patient actually can have control of the time that they need to do uh, home dialysis or dialysis. Uh, I spotted the questions about the improvement of the reduction of the antihypertensive. And there actually have been quite a few studies, including some from Hong Kong as well, showing that if you are doing home dialysis and uh, including home hemodialysis with a more frequent times, and then the blood pressure control is actually much better and then can actually reduce the blood pressure drugs of the patients. So, and in the world of uh, burden about the economy because of dialysis, as well as the burden, because of staff shortage. Actually, if we can train up more patients to do home dialysis, we can also reduce the requirement on the use of staff and also reduce the overall dialysis economic burden. So I dare to say I'm a, still a very strong advocate and I truly believe it is uh, the way to go for the world. And I also think that more importantly is because actually the patient themselves benefit because they benefit from the uh, uh, overall quality of life, overall less stress, and uh, uh, all clinical outcome benefits. So uh, I, once again, uh, thanks for the question from the audience, and, and I think uh, the others can chip in too. I think maybe Tess, I'm not sure what dialysis modality mm -hmm. you have been doing before. Happy to answer. Yes, I knew from the uh, many over many years that when my time came that I would choose home peritoneal dialysis, of course, and I chose uh, deliberately the CAPD because um, two reasons. Uh, one, I wanted to, I don't have a car, 
so and I live alone and I can't um, cope with a machine if I wanted to travel and <laughs> that was very important to me so I was able to uh, to adapt my my home PD uh, so that I could travel with my bikes in a rolling suitcase sufficient for a weekend and uh, had COVID not arrived I was already planning my uh, shipments uh, to the kidney conferences so that I could continue participating and uh, manage my exchanges. And um, I, I was on, it was about 10 months in total uh, that I was on PD. I felt, of course, better. Uh, and indeed, when I went for my transplant, I felt incredibly well, um, I, I, nearly like normal. Um, so yes, I we I do always you know get people to think um, about the home options because I do find that many people seem to be steered in favour of uh, hemodialysis number one, and secondly they automatically think that it's in centre, so they're almost uh, you know mentally prepared for that. Whereas of course we should be talking transplant first, followed by home where transplant isn't an option and uh, enabling people to have that choice of PD or HD uh, at home as much as possible. And I applaud what you've done in Hong Kong. I think it's fantastic to get those results. OK, I just very quickly join you now. It's very good to hear that. I think the issue is the patients need to make an informed, informed choice. Quite often, I feel that they don't have all the information at the beginning to know uh, that's why we need to work and show them what it really is. A lot of people are frightened to do dialysis at home. In fact, it's not, as you probably learn, it's so simple. Um, they have to learn, understand what may be the better on the home dialysis. My numbers are too small at this moment to say, but I boring. The patients who are on home hemodialysis seems to have a better feel or the score than those in center. Those who are at home on automated night PD seems to be slightly better than the three times a day. So there are marginal difference. But I think it's, it's that you need to know the benefit. Not everyone sort of have the same solution for the best for them. If you're working and you think that, okay, I just go to the center, give my hands up, someone dialyze me while I sleep for three times a day, that's fine. If that, that hemodialysis center is next to your office, but you have to travel, it's another story. I think what we need to really give the patient more to me, it's not one step jump to empower the patient. We need to engage them, understand them. They've learned all the things they need to know. Then they make a decision about what it is. And I'm to say, unfortunately, at this moment, the healthcare system um, is, we call about patient-centered care. But at this moment, we're doing system-centered care. The system drives things. The healthcare system drives things. The country wants you to do this. Um, it's the norm at this moment that we have big hemodialysis center and all those things. They are big business, they're big business. They are good. But I think we should offer more options for other people. It's a challenge for us. So just on that point, that last point, can I uh, also ask you to reflect a little bit uh, onto finding solutions? What is the solution? How do we increase patient involvement in their own care as a community? Of course, individual patients will have different levels of engagement or to different levels, they even might want to engage in their own care. But how do we, as a community and in a systematic way, increase patient involvement in care provision at all levels? I'm going to be very brave to something, say something important, which may not be accepted right at this moment. I think the first thing we need to do is us, us healthcare professionals. We need to shift our mind, we shift our mindset, the way that we train for medical school to now, be good at nurses and other things, we serve the patients. The world is changing and we need to work with them together. Um, I see a lot of resistance, I understand the difficulty. If I'm a frontline doctor and I give the patient a lot of choice, I probably need to have half an hour to explain to them on all this. So it's much easier to say, I, I know better, or I have more experience, I won't say I'm better. But I think the first thing we need to do that. It's really work with patients, it's not easy. I know around the world, everyone now put patients into the hospital government committee and other things. Unfortunately, I would say that at this moment, it's still very much a lip service. Yes, they're there, but they just come for a cup of tea. Did we listen to them? So I'd love to have more conversation with you, Tess, later on. 
Happy okay, to. So it's, it's, uh, it is a cult. I would just say I echo that. It is, a, to my mind, a cultural matter. You know, and, and it can start with something simple like first name terms. Uh, I think we're lucky in the UK. There's there's a bit less deference, but you know, when I meet people around the world, it's hair doctor or a hair professor, and immediately that sets a tone for those for the for the partnership. You know, you can't have a partnership where you're feeling uh, inferior. Uh, as a patient and uh, you know that starts from the very beginning from that diagnosis uh, so I would say yes I welcome your tackling it from 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 your point of view and happy to discuss further it's, it's a challenge it's not easy it's also a challenge for us for healthcare professionals I, I always say to patients I believe all healthcare professionals try to do the best for the patients but we have our limitation we have our restraint and that's the difficulty. I think we need to. And I think Edison actually showed one slide, which I think I want to just mention a word. I did a lot of patient survey. What the patients want and what the doctors want as preference are so different, are so different. We're not matching. There's a big gap. We must bring this gap together. What is important to us to make sure you survive and all those things and your data is important, but your patients. I see a positive beginning of all this conversation that we can work together. Right, so thanks. I uh, sorry, uh, it's already one hour and fifty minutes, uh, so we have finished our session. Uh, before I finish, I will ask the three panelists here uh, to give a last word of encouragement to our patients because today is living well with kidney disease. So we we'll start from you, uh, uh, Tess. Yes, well, it's great. It's uniting us. Uh, I've been looking at the Twitter feed, and uh, there's an awful lot of excitement and. And uh, I, I feel a lot of, uh, uh, I say joy, you know, I talked about uh, enjoying the festival life. I think um, it has brought out the joyful side. You look at the images that people are posting. Um, I would say we just keep on encouraging people, uh, t telling them, that, reassuring them that they can live well with kidney disease and that it isn't uh, a death sentence, but uh, they can live a full life and a good life. As if. Right, from our survey, from the question what the patient would like us to do for them, it's very simple. Uh, do you make time to talk to us, understand us, a more bit more compassionate care, um, more concern? Uh, it's not easy, but I think the word is let's talk, let's communicate. Vive? Thanks all, first of all, for, uh, for the wide ranging views and, and message of hope. I would say well begun is already half done. So we are there, we are almost half there, but still there is a fair amount of, uh, you know, travel to be done. And uh, SF, you, you said correctly that it needs to start from the healthcare community because there is so much asymmetry in terms of the balance of power. So the healthcare community needs to reach out and treat patients as their equal partners, uh, starting in first name terms, reducing the deference that, that exists but in the end, also to uh, for patients to feel empowered. Uh, ultimately, it is they who are the centerpiece of this entire uh, enterprise, and they are the ones who need to also, over a period of time, show the medical community what needs to be done. Uh, it's, it's great that we are all doing this together. Uh, we are meeting, and we'll continue to uh, have this conversation. We resolve, as the two organizations here, that we will not uh, let this conversation end just uh, with the change of calendar, right? I mean, so we have to uh, make it a continuous low, uh, you know, hum, much like uh, you hear when you uh, go in, in a jungle or something. So I think it's, it's all great that we have started doing this and I, I hope we'll go from strength to strength. So for myself, I will also, uh sort of uh, encourage uh, all the patients uh, actively participate and uh, and uh, I think that uh, it's well said that I think we have healthcare professionals should communicate more, hold their hands, uh, talking and then see their needs. So with that I would uh, on behalf of Vivek, uh, SF, Tess and myself uh, thank all the speakers and thank all the audiences and all your questions. Uh, we apologize, we cannot finish all the questions, uh, but uh, we hope that somehow uh, that will be answered in the near future. Thank you.